from the New Arts and Media Studios in Milwaukee, I'm Charles Purcell. This is The Log. I want to start today with a um, little blurb I saw in my social media, a friend of mine, and I want to quote him because I think the sentiment is just so very spot on, and I agree with it, and I, I wanted to share this. This from my friend Phoenix Surveyus. Here's what he wrote. Bars and the average work environments do not foster the interpersonal relationships we need to grow and develop our reciprocity with our greater community. The reason I kept trying to create a free space for any member of our community to use however they like, filled with conversation starters, is because we can't just replace the environments we have in school with work environments, virtual social lives, and drug dens. We need to foster environments which encourage as diverse an array of perspectives as possible to mingle and converse soberly in person or will compartmentalize ourselves into oblivion. <laughs> compartmentalize is a good word. It's hard to say. It's good in the written <laughs> text. It's not so much in the verbal text. Anyway, this is something I've thought about often over the years, and I couldn't agree more. Uh, I'm very familiar with the bar scene because I've worked for many years as a musician and a pub trivia host. So a lot of my work has been in bars. My personal experience in bars is a little less. I've never been a bar guy or much of a drinker. But I've spent enough time in bars to understand that Although some people really swear by it and they really love it and it's part of their lifestyle and it's where their friends are and it's where they associate. Okay, all right, I guess I get it. But that doesn't work for everybody. It, it really doesn't work for everybody. And the very presence of alcohol, without getting too sanctimonious about it, just has way too much of an influence. So as my friend Phoenix here is pointing out, we really need environments. We need spaces to be together. He seems to suggest in his post here that school environments are a good place. And, and I think that's probably true. At every level, from grade school on up through college, there are opportunities for friendships and for socializing, for extracurricular activities, as well as the learning itself. There can be great sort of camaraderie and relationship building even within the strict learning environment. So I agree, that's, a, that's one of the positives in our society. But outside of school, so much of our lives is virtual, and I don't want to sound like an old Luddite, like an, oh my gosh, but there's no getting around the fact that it's certainly a different nature than face-to-face -face interpersonal relationships. Leaving all judgment aside, let's all agree it's different. It's a different experience. And then there's the work environment. And depending on the kind of work you do, you can get very close to your work friends. So I'm not going to uh, dismiss any great friendships or relationships that can happen in any of these environments. Certainly it's possible, may maybe even likely. You may think of work friends that you've become close with over the years. There's the uh, added benefit of the common goal, people working together as a team that can be very, really beneficial in a relationship. So I don't think my friend is dismissing these possibilities for connection, but I think he is rightly pointing out that we shouldn't have to just rely on them because there are way too many pitfalls, especially at work. I mean, there's pressure, there's money, <laughs> people you're forced to be with, you're not really choosing to be with these people. It just sort of turns out that way. And the bar thing, as we've said, sure, you could think of all sorts of wonderful, uplifting stories about friends who congregate in bars, but this can't be the only option. And put the alcohol aside for a moment, for me, and you've heard me complain about this before, <laughs> any relationship that requires you to spend money, you have to be taking part in some sort of transaction in order to even be where you are. Uh, fine. All well and good. You want to hang out at a bar? You want to have brunch with your friends? That's fine. Do it. All I'm saying, and I think my friend Phoenix agrees, it shouldn't be our only options. 
Now, here's where I'm going to sound uh, old. But let's face it. Our parents and their parents had a different life, depending how, on how old you are. You might want to go to the next generation. Our parents, their parents, and their parents. There were dances. There were socials. There, were, there was church. There were these opportunities. Uh, there were bowling leagues. There were clubs, the, the Elks and the Ladies Auxiliary or whatever. I know my dad was a, what was he? Um, uh, what do they call it? Oh, VFW, Veterans of Foreign Wars. A bunch of old guys get together and swap war stories and God knows what else. But the point is there were associations. I was in the Cub Scouts. I hated it, but <laughs> I tried it. And uh, at the risk of sounding, and I know I am, sounding really uh, <laughs> old and out of touch, wouldn't it be great if we had more environments, natural spaces, where you didn't have to be drinking, you didn't have to be working, there was no money involved in the transaction. It was just a space where you could be your, your full self and relate with other people as their full selves. I think my friend has a pretty good point. I think that's missing by and large. I think we have to work harder to find those opportunities these days. So uh, anyway, that, that just kind of struck me. So thanks to my friend Phoenix for that. And uh, got me thinking. I like the way he put it. Free space for any member of our community to use however they like, filled with conversation starters. <laughs> I like that. I like that. Um, all right. Next topic here is... <laughs> um, <laughs> trying to come up with a name for the segment. It's a, it, let's talk about white folks for a while, shall we? It's White Folks Corner. I just came across a couple of news items that were eh, kind of, uh, well, here they are. Recently, The Tonight Show with Jimmy Fallon had a segment. Now, I don't, I'm not really a fan of Jimmy Fallon. I liked him during COVID when he was up in his attic. I thought he was much funnier without an audience to try to impress. It was just him and the camera and his two very, very cute little daughters. <laughs> I very much preferred that version of the show. I thought he was actually very kind of charming and funny. Uh, but now he's back in front of an audience and hamming it up, and he's back to his old tricks. And I'm not a fan. I'm not at all a fan. Well, he did something really stupid. And he's been called out for it. He had this woman on for this bit. That's what they call it in the business, a bit. And she was demonstrating all the latest dance moves from TikTok. All the greatest dance moves. This woman's name is Addison Ray. She herself, I guess, is a TikToker. I've never heard of her. But she was invited onto the show to demonstrate all the hot new dances, the top eight TikTok dances. So as Jimmy Fallon stands behind her and off to the left, he's got these big sort of uh, cue card type cards with the name of the dance. And then the music is playing and she demonstrates that dance. Now, the problem is nearly all of those eight dances were invented and performed by TikTokers that were mostly young and black. And so this young, good-looking white woman gets invited onto the Tonight Show stage to demonstrate these dances. And I, I, I tend to have some mixed feelings about the whole concept of appropriation. I really think it's great when art of any kind music, dance, uh, fashion, whatever, even language, crosses in and out of different subcultures, even if it's race-related. I tend to think that much of what is labeled cultural appropriation can be more generously labeled uh, homage or just plain cross-cultural sharing. I'm usually for it, and I usually kind of hesitate about that accusation of cultural appropriation. But there are some cases when 
it, it can't be denied. And there are some times when it's just blatantly obvious and kind of gross and horrible. And this is one of those examples. And especially if, if you watch the bit, she's this very perky, attractive, young, white woman. Uh, I guess you'd call it dancing. She's, you know, she's not the greatest dancer in the world. I guess she gets it done. And it's also, it's also horribly basic. And, you know, when the term white is used as a disparaging characterization, like a lot of people, I've got some friends who, one friend especially, I know, who likes to share old uh, Lawrence Welk clips <laughs> and say things like, you know, could this be any whiter? <laughs> Just had one this past weekend, as a matter of fact. The Lennon sisters singing, um, hey there, Georgie girl. Da, 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 da. And yeah, okay, so the whole so white meme can be kind of funny. It really can. This wasn't funny. This was horrible. And it was especially horrible. Somebody on social media did a side-by-side -side video of the woman doing her version of the dance right next to the original TikTok creator. And of course, there was no comparison. It's like eating a carrot straight out of a garden that you pull out of the dirt compared to the carrot you buy at the grocery store. It's like, is this the same vegetable? There's no comparison. So the video on the left, the original TikToker, was filled with art and energy and spirit. And the one on the right was just filled with, I don't know. I know what I was filled with. It was just sadness. It was just so pathetically sad. So the fact that this even got on the air, this very, very bad idea, I don't know how it gets through all the filters. That's got to go through producers and writers and ultimately through Fallon himself. He's got to, he okays everything that's on the show. He's the boss. It's his name up on the marquee. How did they let this through? It doesn't sound like a, a story that I might get all up in arms about. But you know what? I do. This, is a, this represents a very tragic, brutal history of white exploitation of black culture. And TikTok itself, I think we're making a mistake if we just laugh it off as some silly little fad. It's a tremendous tool for creativity. And it's kind of fascinating to watch this arms race between, on one side, real grassroots, authentic internet performers, artists, creators, and then on the other side, the moneyed interests and the basic culture and the mega mainstream media always working to co-opt any creativity as quickly as they can or to shut it down if they don't understand it, to criticize it. I mean, there's this great sort of monumental struggle happening between real authentic artists with only the power of their creativity and then those grand gatekeepers and the exploiters well, Jimmy Fallon landed squarely on the exploitation side of this struggle, and shame on him. Normally, my criticism of the Jimmy Fallons of the world is that they're just making us all dumber, and it's all just so ridiculous and silly, and then his defenders will be quick to point out, oh, it's just good, clean fun. Why are you being so serious? And I can take that criticism, and sometimes I even agree. I suppose it's not that important. But this, this steady drip, drip, drip of mediocrity is what drives me batty. You and I have talked about this many times. But this was more than just one of those little drips. It was a really regrettable moment. And again, I don't know how it got through all the filters. I don't know how it got past every producer and writer and how it got past Fallon himself. What a terrible mistake. The woman herself, this uh, Addison Ray, I guess it's hard to turn down an offer to be on The Tonight Show, but shouldn't she have had some awareness of what she was doing? White folks, come on, man. We're trying to have a society here. As famous white character George Costanza once yelled, 
We're trying to have a society here. Can we get on board? Can we at least not miss the obvious stuff? I mean, I know it's I know it's complicated. I know racism is deeply embedded into our culture, into our history, and we have to work every day to try to purge it. It should be the greatest mission of every white person in America. I mean, the term itself, let's not go too far afield here. I saw a post the other day, friend of a friend. I don't know if they were trying to be funny or they were serious or what, but the, the tone of the post was a little bit tongue-in-cheek, as though they weren't being totally serious. They said, well, why isn't it European-American? Why, why are we called white? We should be European-Americans, like they're African-Americans, Asian-Americans. And then this long thread of people saying what you might expect, well, I don't think we should have any hyphenated Americans and, and on one side, and then other people saying, well, uh, yeah, European-American is an appropriate thing to say. I think it is. That's what I've always said. Um, this is going off on a tangent, but I'm going to, I'm going to allow it. <laughs> I'm not only the prosecutor of this show, I'm the judge. I will allow it. I will allow this tangent. Uh, when I was a boy, <laughs> man, sounding old today. When I was a kid, it was very common in my little white town which was just an incredibly white town. I mean, 100%. Uh, it was completely normal. And in every conversation, when you meet somebody new, you meet a new friend, uh, what pops up is, where are your people from? Well, my uh, father's parents were uh, Scottish and Irish, and my mom's parents were Swedish. And how about you? Oh, well, both of my parents were Polish. And uh, you, you knew your friends. I knew my friend Judy was German. I mean, she was a, probably a second-generation American, but I knew, you just knew. You knew which one of your friends were Polish and German and which ones are Irish, and it was just common knowledge. We shared that information. It was part of our identity. We all knew what we were, where we, our, our people were from, and there was nothing at all weird about it. We knew it about ourselves, and we knew it about our friends. Of course, we never thought of ourselves as white, because there were no people of color in my little white town. So I never thought of myself as white until much, much later. So the term European-American is fine with me, or Italian-American, or Polish-American. I think that's fine. I'm really not uh, opposed to the hyphenated identities. I think it's kind of sweet, actually. I think it's kind of nice. Well, then, of course, the obvious problem is black Americans, many of them don't know where they're from because their family identity was stolen through the institution of slavery. So African Americans or black Americans, these are acceptable terms. Same thing with Hispanic or Latino or Latinx or however anybody wants to identify. I'm really okay with that. I sort of pine for the days when it was uh, very natural to have these conversations, it's, I think it's of interest to know where you're from. And again, many black folks don't have that uh, advantage because of America's greatest and original sin. But here on White Folks Corner, I'm here to say, fellow white folks, uh, I think we really ought to avoid the term. We'll change the name of the segment to European American Corner. The term white, with a capital W, is just kind of odd, and it really can only be defined by what we're not, not what we are. And when we do something really stupid like Jimmy Fallon did, that is a white folks error, a white folks sin, a white folks problem. So I don't know where all this is landing, except that uh, I'm, I'm becoming increasingly uncomfortable with the term itself, with the term white. I don't, I don't know what it serves, except, and maybe this is okay, maybe it's okay, uh, it serves a purpose when we need to uh, scold ourselves, when we need to point out the problems, kind of like when your mother called you by your full name. If your name's Bob and, you're, and when your mother said, Robert, you knew you were in trouble, right? That kind of thing. Maybe, maybe that's, that's how we should use the term white folks. All right, white people, listen up. It's when we're in trouble. And uh, yeah, Jimmy Fallon just really screwed up here. And this Addison Ray person. Bad, bad move. 
Uh, speaking of terms, a reminder here, let's all stop using the term Caucasian, shall we? Caucasian is a terrible term that needs to be never, ever used again. Some old guy, I don't remember his name, I once knew, but now I forgot. Uh, some old racist from the old days decided that the people of the Caucasus region of Europe were the, uh, were the perfect race of people. He decided that they were the model of what a human should be. And of course, they were white. And that's where the term Caucasian comes from. This old guy just decided that, uh, yeah, Caucasian means white, but not only white, it means the purest, most perfect race, the Caucasians. So that's the origin of that word, and that's why we should never, ever use it again. So just, just toss that out, would you? Just toss it out. And if you have any power, if you're on the city government or anything, if you have the power to take it off of forms that we fill out, uh, let's bury that word forever, shall we? It's, it's a racist word with racist origins, and I don't want to have anything to do with it. All right, so Jimmy Fallon, if you haven't already, apologize for that, please, and do better in the future. Uh, late night talk hosts are really good at apologizing. They have to do it every once in a while. <laughs> and they got a nice little... Uh, venue there they got they got their desk they're sitting at they look like the damn president behind the resolute desk you know it's a great place to make an apology so uh jimmy fallon do that and uh while we're in white folks corner <laughs> pending a new name for the segment i gotta mention this other little story you may have seen this running around your social media it pops up occasionally it's been around for years uh, nobody knows quite where the story comes from, but here's the story. An anthropologist, sh by the way, there's a picture accompanying this short little story. A white guy showing his camera to three or f uh, four very interested little children who are wearing loincloths and they are black with a sandy terrain. So I guess he's in Africa, it suggests, and these are tribal children. Here's the story. An anthropologist showed a game to the children of an African tribe. He placed a basket of delicious fruits near a tree trunk and told them, the first child to reach the tree will get the basket. When he gave them the start signal, he was surprised that they were walking together, holding hands until they reached the tree and shared the fruit. He asked, why did you do that when every one of you could get the basket for yourself? They answered with astonishment, Ubuntu. That is, how can one of us be happy while the rest of us are miserable? Ubuntu in their civilization means, I am because we are. That tribe knows the secret of happiness that has been lost in all societies that transcend them and which consider themselves civilized societies. Exclamation point. Oh, there is so much wrong with this. And even more, the reaction it gets, the comments. Oh, what a beautiful term. How wonderful, this tribe of Ubuntu. Which, by the way, there is no Ubuntu tribe. Ubuntu is a concept. It's a word. And I guess it's translated correctly. I am because we are kind of all for one, one for all. I guess that is a concept. Fine. That's cool. But the very idea that this very privileged portly photographer is showing off his sparkly new camera to these tribal children, that this story advances some sort of a noble savage trope, and oh, how wonderful it is that these uncivilized people are actually the civilized ones. It's just so condescending. And the comments, be kind to all humans by keeping your heart open. I love the kindness in his heart. I can see it. I can feel it. I don't know who she's talking about, this commenter. I guess she's talking about the photographer. Oh, isn't it wonderful that he's kind to black people? In Africa, no less. I use the term Ubuntu with my children. The world is full of people that will happily create divide and unhappiness. Ubuntu represents helping each other achieve happiness together. Okay. I mean, this is all just very fine. and all, These are... <laughs> 
all, all these people have a good heart. None of them are, are malicious in any way. But don't they realize what they're participating in here? This grotesque sort of white privilege, the noble savage thing. Lessons we can learn from this beautiful civilization. And yet, would any single one of these commenters switch places? Would they join this tribe? Would they shave their head and put on their loincloth and live in this uh, desert area of Africa? Of course they wouldn't. It's just so beautiful and wonderful to do this virtue signaling, which is a term I don't normally use. I think that's a, a kind of an insulting term. <laughs> I, don't, I don't use it. People are trying to do the right thing. Don't accuse them of virtue signaling. But in this case, it's uh, kind of what it means. Oh my God, I just had the biggest wave of goosebumps. I love this so very much. Children's ethics show compassion and love. One for all and all for one. We could learn a lesson here. May maybe I'm being too hard on these people. But the comments just go on and on and on and on. There are thousands of them. This story has been shared, this particular link, uh, let's see, uh, over 3,000 comments and 259,000 shares. Uh, so I'll bet you've seen this, and maybe it warmed your heart, but all I see is, all I see is white privilege and virtue signaling, and I think it's gross. And no, there's no Ubuntu tribe. I know I saw that in some of the comments. God bless the Ubuntu tribe. Uh, it doesn't exist. Am I wrong about this? Should I not be so uh, dismissive of this post? Yeah, screw your virtue signaling. Screw your noble savage trope. Screw your uh, crocodile goosebumps. Not a damn one of you would change... A a single thing about your life, about your privileged life, to achieve the wisdom of these small children. And who knows if the story is true or not? Nobody really knows if the story is true. Nobody, nobody knows the exact origin or who this guy is, who this anthropologist is. They never name the anthropologist. So I guess this is just my personal plea to my fellow privileged European Americans, people of no color. <laughs> Maybe that's better. That's better than white. The people of no color. <laughs> we can do a lot better than this. Get your heads out of the memes. Leave your comfort zone. Find neighborhoods and restaurants and public places where everybody doesn't look exactly like you. And try to have some real communications with people. This comfortable privilege this bubble from which we can claim to have all these good feelings and good intentions, it's getting to be a pretty old act. It's real, it really is. So, so let's be better. We can be better. We can learn. I can learn. I can be better every day. Let's do it. Let's do it together, shall we? All right. There it is. That'll be the last word for today. I do love you. I hope you're well. I'm Charles Purcell. <laughs>